Today, I want to give you a look behind the curtain of a huge show I had the opportunity to mix last month. It was originally in person at a big hotel, a huge lively audience, a lot of entertainment. And just like the pandemic has forced a lot of shows to do this, it pivoted completely virtual. But it wasn't just another boring, here's a bunch of people on Zoom talking to each other. This was going to look like Jimmy Fallon, but across a whole entire corporate entity. It's going to be broadcasted out all over the world. So we had our home base here in Arkansas. It was going out all over. They brought in a broadcast truck from Nashville and they said, hey, you, you're in charge of the audio team and you are mixing the broadcast. Make it so. It was a 56 person crew, nine cameras, five graphics up, two A2s. It was huge. And I want to take you through what was that like for me to have to plan for it, to be on the show, to manage that crew, to actually mix it, the challenges it came up against. I hope you give you some insight at what it takes to be an A1, especially on these high pressure corporate shows. We're going we're gonna to take a look at how I kept track of over 30 different presenters and made sure I hit all my cues, how I trusted my program limiter to make sure I got my levels nice and hot, what specific playback software came in clutch uh, as I was managing all these audio stingers, and then how I prepared to have a mix of remote presenters if we needed to have that. Uh, but before I jump in, I've got a gift for you. It is my audio math survival spreadsheet. Uh, at the very, very bottom of it now, or at least at this current version, uh, is my RF calculator. It's something I learned from Stephen Pavlik, and I had to coordinate you know, 24 channel or 26 channels of wireless on this show and, and set up eight different paddles throughout the room. So that is at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit, or you can snag it at the link below. It also has a ton of great sound system design calculations. So let's jump right into the show scope and step through everything that I encountered on this show. We're going to first give you the show scope, the lay of the land, what was going on, create that context. Then we'll talk about my specific job within that role, what uh, I was thinking about during the show, what I had to manage on setup, all that. Then we'll dive more in the nitty gritty of engineering, all the RF coordination, how I set up my console and those specific challenges. And then how my mixing strategy for the show, what specific things with the microphones we had to use or how I kept up the cues popped up. And then we'll land the plane with some key takeaways, the, the, the five or six biggest things I learned from being on the show or that I was grateful for I want to do better on next time. This was an internal show with sensitive material, so I apologize I cannot share much more detail about the content itself or show you more pictures of the inside. I can show you pictures of the truck itself and my broadcast setup, but that's it. So I'm gonna have to describe a lot. I apologize, it'd be a lot easier with diagrams, but I can't do that today. So this is high pressure, high budget, all over the world. <laughs> Just to reiterate, reiterate that, it's like we're not gonna be able to do it over. This is live from Arkansas, we're, we're going out. We had a setup day, a tech rehearsal day, a client rehearsal day, and then the show. So we had to load everything in, get it all set up and talking. Tech rehearsals made sure everything was, was working, that we were comfortable with the show flow itself, ironed out any of that. And then third was we had the, the, the client, each of the presenters, and there were over 30 of them, come in throughout the day in different segments as they were available to rehearse what's going on. But the, the hard part was that we did not rehearse the show in order because of the talent's availability. Not everyone was be able to come in at the perfect time. Okay, the first person of the show come in first and, and second, third, and so on. They come in at different chunks. So it made it so that on show day, that was the first time we ever saw it top to bottom. So that was definitely a challenge to not have it really under our belts from seeing it top to bottom. We just had all the puzzle pieces and we put them together on the fly on the day. It went great. But uh, it was kind of scary knowing they're like, okay, we've never seen this before. The broadcast truck came in from Nashville. It was a great crew, a great truck. It was it was me mixing the broadcast inside the truck on a VI, Soundcraft VI3000. And then next to me, I guess through the glass wall or whatever it was, was the TD actually punching the show and then the camera director calling the nine cameras. Inside the room, we had the five sets and the crew that were out there with the talent making things happen were our A2s, our stage managers, our nine camera ops. We had a really great jib operator, a steady cam operator that really made some from very cool, fluid uh, and theatrical looking shots. We also had a LD who was making some movers dance and made sure all the sets look good. We had a DP who was on the coordinating with the lighting director and the camera director to make sure all the shots look great. Uh, we had Grip Truck who provided all the more theatrical lighting and did a great job there. And then we had in video control, which is a separate room where we had our show caller. So we had the truck video, but that what I'll call video control inside the venue. Had the show caller, executive producer, or the engineer. There was a video 
basically router person that handled all getting all the graphics and inputs into a switcher there and it could route it out to any of the DSMs or monitors around the sets, all of the executive viewing area and made and made sure everyone inside the video control room had all the multi views and could see actual program there. And then the truck handled it actually get, gathering all those same inputs and push it out to the stream. So it was a kind of a interesting division of labor and responsibility between two different video switchers and two different operators. We had five graphics operators. Some of them were handing lower thirds, video playback. And so that gave me four different audio sources in X, Y, A, and B. Two are graphics, two are playback. So that's where videos came from. And then our show caller had an Excel spreadsheet in front of her. It was able to calmly step us through. Here's what's coming up. Here's what's happening. And we all keyed in and listened to her. And, and the second most person who was most active on comm talking us through stuff was the camera director uh, who was calling all that while listening to our show caller. Then I had all that going on in my <laughs> little speaker in my room, hearing what was happening and then mixing the broadcast and listening to that. I had 24 channels of wireless, 20 of them ended up being laws that had four handhelds. There were over 30 different presenters and most of them shared the wireless laws, but there was also a news desk set that had four wired laws. And so we had four different or three different groups of people rotate through and put on the wireless, wired law talk and then switch out to another set and then come back with another group of people. And also had two channels of wireless in-ears, one for the DJ and one for some other talent that ended up not performing on the show. <clears throat> it was also snowing. So here in Arkansas, it hit us really hard and made it difficult for vehicles to get around. So we also had to prepare for remote presenters. So we really had to make Zoom flex if we needed to, to have someone present live from Zoom, get a mix minus back to them, coordinate with them over calm. So that was definitely something we had to be ready for. Yeah, there was video playback, audio stingers for me. So those were used for transitions. Uh, so at the very end of a segment, someone said, okay, back to you, Jim and sports or whatever. I would fade up an audio track of these pre-selected 30 second pieces of music that, you know, the jib shot would pan out and they would move over to a different set. And I had music behind them to create some energy. And so my audio playback op was next to me with a software called Farago, firing all of those in order and making sure our transitions were nice and tight and high energy. So my specific role was yes, to mix the broadcast. We've already talked about that, but I also had to lead the audio team on setup. They were all reporting to me to make sure they knew what was going on. Some of them were new working with this event production company, so didn't know where all the gear was or what their cases looked like. So I helped coach them and say, here's the plan. Here's what you're doing. Do you have any questions? Go. They're all competent human beings, but I was ultimately responsible for making sure they knew what was happening, where to go, how to set it up and that all rolled up to me. I used uh, checklists at the beginning of each day to say, here's what we need to get done. Do you have any questions? And I'll, I'll step you through those checklists and how I manage them a little bit later. So here's what it looked like for me on the show. Actually in real time during the, those two hours we were all going is I was mixing the broadcast, but again, not only the audience depended on me, but that had to be rock solid for the camera director to be able to hear the broadcast and, and see who's talking and know when to cut the camera for the show caller to hear what was happening. And then the executives over in the viewing area to hear what was happening and make sure they know what's going on with the show. So I had to really make sure I was on top of all my cues and handled all that well. I had to stay on top of who was coming up next. My A2s were responsible for making sure the right wireless pack was on the right person. But then as I was towards the end of a segment and I, I really felt like that was dialed in, I, I get on calm and ask my A2s like, hey, we're coming up to this next set. This is, you know, Jim, Bob, and Jill. Do they have these lobs? Yes, they do. And if they were able to get come and mic'd up before that, they would let me know when they were there. Hey, I got this love pack on Jill. She's on love number seven. Do you hear her? And they would ask them what they had for breakfast, have the talent talk. I would PFL it, put my headphones on while I'm listening to the program, while I'm listening to calm and making sure I could hear that. And like, yes, I got that microphone. It sounds good. And then I also use my computer off to the side. I had one computer running the playback software for all my audio stingers. I had another with the RF coordination software, wireless workbench. And that was there. And I was able to network into all the wireless and see RF levels, look at the battery levels. And the A2s would usually be responsible for this, but since there was so much action from like a stage manager standpoint, so many different people, it took a lot of their time and energy just to get lobs on people and coordinate, make sure the right person was on the right lob. So I ended up having to, 
look at levels a lot and make sure everything stayed stable. And I'll go through exactly how I deployed that system and coordinate it a little bit later. But that was something I was keeping track of in the truck. And then I also had to coordinate with the in-room A1 and make sure all the sources that he was getting to mix for the, the monitors in the room and then the, the studio program feed and the executive listening and viewing area feed was all kosher. We ended up, we didn't talk a whole lot during the show, but if he had any questions about what was coming up, he could hop on comm and talk to me. So you had to recon that, mix the broadcasts, coordinate with A2s to make sure wireless is good and the right mic is in the right location, hit any of the audio stingers and coordinate with my audio playback op and make sure my A1 in the room, uh, all my stems that I was sending back to him were all, were all good. Now I'll jump into more of my console file and how we work sharing inputs out here in a second. So let's jump into engineering, the truck setup, patching and RF management, It'll be a lot of fun. All right, so here's the truck. It was T and DV out of Nashville. They were a great crew to work with and they helped me get settled in. The console I was on was here as a VI 3000 by Soundcraft. You can see I had program right here in the middle. I was able to look at nine different camera shots, which was great to be able to look at different sets and make sure people's lobs were staying on straight. And then I also had prompter over here so I could track with what was going on and as the executives were reading the script. Some, not all of them used a script, but a lot of them did. So uh, I was really nice to keep track of what was going on. This right here is a Duro loudness meter and another separate meter here that I was able to look at and measure in LUFS the program. This was after my audio got embedded in Video World and spit back to me. So it was as downstream as we could go. So I was able to trust the peak metering there and all the loudness to make sure that's how loud it was getting things out to program. I ended up going with negative 18 LUFS and was was plenty loud to get out where I needed to go. I had these nice little Genelex. I haven't worked on these before. I forget the model number, but they, they served me well. They were clear, no weird resonances. Then up here, is this little Fostech speaker. I had production comm coming through that all the time. So the show caller, anytime that camera director hopped in there, I could hear them. And then there was a little speaker inside this little comm unit that had the microphone that I could talk into and I could hear my A2s specifically talk through that. Uh, up here is the patch bay and I was able to pick off an analog output of my program and actually run it down here through a tie line into my audio interface so I can get an RTA on it. So I'll step through that in a second. But first the console layout. I was unable to get the console file to load in the simulator of the VI3000. So here's just my input list. I had the 24 wireless LOVs, four wired LOVs. I also had a backup 58 at each set. So just in case my wireless rack went down or somebody dropped the microphone or hit their law off their shirt, my A2 could then go pick up a, a SM58 and hand it to them and they could talk and be right back in business. I put a always had a 50 foot, very nicely coiled cable right there. Uh, so if they picked up the 58, they weren't yanking it and getting a bunch of pretzels. It was ready to go and pull. And I know that if anyone picked it up, it would be have enough slack that would get no knots and was ready to go there. I had these eight graphics inputs. I get, there were four stereo pairs that were from MacBooks going into JDIs and then sending over analog into my stage box. The stage box I had in the room was a 64 in, 32 out. It was over fiber, connecting me back to the truck. Then I had a pair of DIs dropped at the DJ and he gave me his output and I, he was able to ride his master volume a little bit, but most mostly he stayed constant. I also accounted for some effects returns on the console because that's how the VI 3000 wants to work is just use channels as your effects returns. And I also had some talkback channels we ended up not using because we just use comm if I needed it. The truck outputs, I was sending program left, right out to uh, my A1 in the venue, then he used his console to distribute that out to video control, the executive viewing area, or any of the monitors. And then he also had a set of stems back for me. So why we did this is the console he was on was an M32. It's got 32 inputs, or you can use some of the aux inputs to get 40 or 38 or whatever. Uh, but instead of him having to actively mix all these monitors with all these separate inputs and basically mirror what I was doing, we ended up sending all the LOVs and each of the sets 
of their stems back into a stem that he could send wherever he needed and just say, hey, this set is up. Let me send this group of mics somewhere else. So he wasn't going to have to actively mix every input. So he had all the set stems. He had the 58s as a stem and all the playback as a stem. So this included my audio stingers, video playback, graphics playback, and that was all there. Or he could just send a copy of my program wherever he needed. So we had enough flexibility to, to isolate stuff if he needed it to. Let's say we were at set A and we we're pitching to set B. You could have program audio in set B and he said, now over to you. He would mute program. They would start talking, put program back over and set A. So this talent knew that they were on anymore. And we had to coordinate with our stage managers to make sure that was smooth. But it ended up working really nicely. The, the busing on the VI3000 gives you option or mono or stereo per bus. So you don't have to eat up two. That was a nice feature. I never worked on that console before, by the way. So it was nice to have like, oh, yeah, here's a big show. You better learn it. So I was able to download the simulator ahead of time, get, get used to it. I had to figure out a couple of things I didn't know on site. One of them being how to make a bus pre-fader. That took me a while, but I ended up figuring it out. But overall, that was a nice experience working on that console. So for the actual program mix, I had the LAVs. <clears throat> and 58s playbacks, any bands, all these as groups. And so no individual input hit the stereo bus directly. They all went to the group first, then to the stereo bus. And then all these stems down here were broken out and they were as post fader auxes. So here that patch bay, I was able to, there was a tie line you can't see. It was just below this monitor right here. But an XLR to TRS cable and ran it into my audio interface. And then I had this tool, Tonal Balance Control. It is a lifesaver. And what it is, is basically a fancy RTA that has a target curve for you. And I'm gonna play this music track. You won't hear it, but it'll make the RTA do its thing. But it basically gives me a curve. And if anything's outside of these bounds, I might wanna take a look at it. And one thing I discovered during rehearsals is that the lavs we had were these countrymen, sub-miniature lavs, <clears throat> and they had a big buildup at 500 hertz on almost everybody. So I was cutting six or 10 dB at four or 500 hertz most of the time. And I was seeing a big uh, spike here in that range at that frequency. And that was good to be able to tell it. I could hear it too, but one thing in the truck, it was super cold outside because it was snowing. So they ran the heater. So it was in the vent return was right over me. So it's kind of loud in the truck. Uh, they had to turn the truck on to make sure things were staying stable. They had the heater. I was unfamiliar with those Genelex. And so having a tool like this, so I could just look at it and be like, am I cool? And help just gut check what I was hearing was really handy to have. I also had my laptop, uh, my other laptop next to me running. One was running the RF coordination software and one was running Farago, the playback software. So we'll do RF then Farago. So this is wireless workbench. If you're unfamiliar, we're using all Shure gear. It was 24 channels of Shure ULXD. Where they were the G50 band. Then I also had two PSM 900 wireless units and they were the G7 bands. Uh, I forgot to save my later show file. This only has the 24 channels uh, of the ULXD, but this is how I coordinated it. I did a scan in the venue and I didn't see any other RF that was on. The noise floor was actually pretty low, and I dished out all these frequencies within the G50 band. Same thing with the with the wireless in-ears. I made the mistake of coordinating all the ULXD first, then adding in the wireless in-ears and not having them uh, from the get-go. I actually had to undo some of the coordination I did from the, from the ULXDs to fit in the PSM 900s because the PSM 900s are not as agile. Uh, I love the monitor page here. I was able to set up different tabs of RF channels 1 through 16 and 17 through 24 and see my RF levels, the transmit strength, the battery level, if the mute was on, if the input pad was on. I could see all that in one, one, one place. So having a robust network that I was able to connect into was really, really helpful. It's not that I didn't trust my A2s. Oftentimes they were busy chasing down executives and could not look at RF at the time. So I know in the truck, I could always look, hey, here's the next queue. It's LAVS 5678. I'll go look at LAVS 5678. They look good, fantastic. I can also see from a timeline perspective, here's 5678. It's not showing it here, but it would show me a little graph over time, the RF levels, the battery. And if RF levels I looked were staying consistent, my A2s verify with me that that talent was in the room and they were outside the range of my RF network, and then we were good to go. As far as making sure all these five different sets had the correct RF, ended up, or, the RF zones and coverage, I used 
my RF microphone link budget. This is completely stolen from Nathan Lively and Stephen Pavlik. Uh, this is a fantastic video you should go watch. And I basically just took the what they stepped into and put it in my spreadsheet. And I know Stephen didn't come up with this calculation, but he's the one who was able to step through it and it really made sense to me. So I borrowed this calculation and made eight copy visit because that's how many antennas I had in the room because I had these five different zones, but only eight antennas. So I had to double up on one, but I had an A and a B antenna for each of the zones. And they went back into an RF combiner that was allowed to take it and then distribute out the A and B channel to each of my RF racks. They were all ULXD 4, 4D Qs or the quad units. So they're four channels. So I had six racks of four channels each. I had to distribute RF out of the combiner into each of them. I had to cascade two of them because the combiner I had uh, had four outputs. So I was able to look at location 1A and I was put in this this location I needed I had a hundred foot LMR 400 RF cable and it, that's how long it and the, how long the cable was from the RF uh, combiner to or distributor my brain's kind of fried at the moment so I'm sorry you RF people I'm using the wrong word um, and it ran out to the antenna and the antenna from where the talent was going to be standing was about 15 feet so I took all those variables and threw it in here and I just chose a transmit frequency of 500 hertz because I was about the middle of the range I was using and I was going to come up with my link budget it basically tells me here's the estimated RF strength at that spot if I'm running that length of cable with that transmit strength of that pack having to go that far of wireless transmit distance and that gave me my calculation. I ended up having the whole rig within 6 dB and things stayed really stable from set to set to set. Um, I could, if I wanted to, maybe turned up the gain on one of the paddles or maybe uh, turned down some on different zones. I had the capability, but I honestly did get around to it, but RF was rock solid for me. Next from an engineering standpoint is the playback software I use. It's called Farago. It's made by Rogue Amoeba. At the very top of the show, you see in green were these five different tracks and we had a 10 minute countdown and the DJ would check in and talk and then spin a little bit, talk and spin. And he, these were all the same five tracks he had coming from his turntable, but I had these rolling as a backup just in case his turntable went down and we would still have the same track rolling as the walking music. Then out of the intro video, we had a very specific stinger that would be played and so me and the audio playback op would watch the prompter, hear them get to the end of their sentence, and then immediately hit the stinger and boom, have it high energy, and then fade it out as we saw on the screen over here that the jib shot would get there um, and the graphic would come off. And then we had different cues for other playbacks and songs lined up. The production company already had a tech of theirs, pick the right music uh, and trim them down, which was great. Um, so I had purple for kind of just generic tracks. I had a big folder of them. We had a very specific track here in yellow, and then a walkout track uh, of Bruce Springsteen, which is really cool. This was an internal broadcast, so we didn't have to worry about copyright, so it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, it doesn't look like a whole lot right here, but getting all the right assets to play at the right time in the right order and making sure they're all trimmed and the transitions felt great was a lot to manage, but the playback op I had with me was fantastic, and he did a really great job. Okay, that's enough about engineering, the, the, the IO, the RF, and the playback. Now let's jump into how I manage myself on the show and manage the team. Checklists are a lifesaver for me. I'm an Enneagram 9, so everything seems good all the time. I can just kind of go with whatever. And so having, hey, just do this, do this, do this. I've already decided in advance this is what's the priority in the right order. And so I use Obsidian for this because it doesn't rely on the internet to be available. <laughs> I usually use Notion for main project planning, but once I'm on site, I like Obsidian since it doesn't have to rely on the internet to get connection. So the tech rehearsal checklist here in the right is what we looked at first. My initials are MKC. It said, here are the first things, here's the general stuff, and here's what I need to do. And then for each of my direct reports, the in-room A1, the comm A2, and the talent A2, I said, hey, here's what you need to do. Need to do. The, my playback op wasn't added until very end of the tech rehearsal day, so I didn't have to-dos for him yet. But here's what it, it looked like uh, for me to delegate these tasks. I knew... I needed to lead the meeting, print this out, get everyone on comm. I needed to get my MacBook on the truck Wi-Fi, really make sure my RF calculations were right, were right, and I wanted to be able to test the RF, walk around with a bunch of microphones and make sure I had no drops, and then look at my timeline on my software, make sure it was good. 
On this day, I need to make sure the auto mixer was, was good. On the VI3000, you have two audio mixers, 16 channels each, so I had to make sure all of the cues I had, I had the right channels going to the right audio mixer, set up LUFS, get my mute, mute groups, dial in DSers, just make sure and set up my custom layers. So at different points in the show, I had different custom layers to make sure like, hey, we're here, hit up this custom layer. All the inputs I needed to have available to me would pop up in the right spot. So this is mainly just, hey, make sure the team's good and then set up my console. For the in-room A1, I said, hey, you are the monitor mixer. Here's what you're responsible for. You're quickly get any source to any monitor. Make sure audio gear and video worlds functioning properly. So any of the JDIs that were capturing audio from video stuff, any of the speakers in control so they get what's going on. And then I want you to test all outputs independently. So get pink noise, run it through every single output, make sure all passing is the same, all levels, will, all levels are good. We had the speakers at each of the zones on the sets to stay incognito on the ground. So if someone walked by, kicked the speaker, you know, accidentally hit the input to mic level instead of line level, we bring up video cue, people would die on the set. So just have him make sure all that. So his specific checklist were to verify signal throughout all the place of fallback spe speakers, make sure the executive listening area was good, uh, test the DJ IEMs, make sure everything's clean. So my comm A2, I called him King Com. <laughs> so he was responsible for dishing out all the wireless compacts. We had 10 different free speak packs and he made sure each of them had the right roles and we're able to be assigned, uh, label everyone's headsets. So we're not sharing them because it's still COVID time. So we're not, you know, sharing things that have been right next to our mouth all day, collect them, make sure they're charging at the end of the day. Cause I've been on a couple shows where you, you open up the drawer and nothing had charged and it's an hour until we start. And so that that's really scary. So I just really reiterated to him, make sure things charge at the end of the day. He had a uh, dish out all the wireless comm, check all the wired comm. A part of it got a little bit noisy and actually ended up being a bad belt pack. And we fixed that. Had him run lines for the DJ, make sure the sub was there. It was good. So, and then I had my talent A2. Uh, my comm A2 was also responsible during the show to make sure he could help mic up talent, but this was my primary RF and talent A2. So you, I said, you own wireless pack battery life, labeling and mic management. I want you to know at all times who's on what pack, where are they at and what show, uh, what is coming up. So I want you to, if you can memorize the cues, at least have a cheat sheet next to you at all times to know like, hey, we're in this portion of the show, here's what's coming up. These people are on the four wired microphones. We have LAVs 9, 10, 11, 12 coming up next on this set. Make sure you're really good. So you need to have clear labeling, a really good understanding of the show, and be able to think quick on his feet if someone was late and what they're going to do. Or someone says, hey, I was going to be on a handheld, now I want a LAV, which, which microphone to pick. Make all that. Need to make sure all the batteries charged. Uh, I said make sure over lunch, get everything back on, on the charging session, uh, also, uh, on the charging stations. Uh, cable management at hit everything RF and collect any spar spare audio cabling and then help me. Uh, we actually had to overnight some extra RF cable to make sure we could execute our setup and he helped me with that. So now moving over to our rehearsal day talent checklist. This is what I had to really confirm my reverb sends and returns if they wanted the national anthem or added back a drummer or whatever. I decided, hey, I, I wanted to flip RF channels 21 and 22 over to spare backup handhelds. So my A2s would have two levels of redundancy. If a presenter was talking, their law stopped working, they'd immediately reach in the back pocket, hand them a wireless handheld. If that did not work, they had the wired SM58, then they could hand to them. And then we allocated a, a dedicated wireless handheld for the DJ. He was originally on a wired. Uh, we ended up solving this. I wanted an extra monitor in the truck to view prompter, but the truck was able to route it over to that uh, the monitor we saw earlier in it, like a boss, it was awesome. Uh, I wanted to test and make sure the audio stingers I had during the DJ segment were working correctly and we could fail over, right? There was, the, the monitor wasn't working at one point, so we had to fix that. I had to add in new cabling once we got the other RF cables shipped in. And then we had a playback stem of a separate computer that got added just for this specific video and audio cue for the very front with the dancer. So we had to add that into our show scope. They had to uh, pull in the Springsteen track in Farago. They had, hey, we want a special walkout tune, <clears throat> but I don't like to rely on Spotify for my playback ever, unless it's just normal walk-in music and it's not part of the show. So I captured it with Audio Hijack, another software from Rogue Amoeba, had as an audio file, then pulled it into Farago for playback. Don't tell Bruce I did that. Um, so made sure my intro songs were great. 
Uh, I wanted to make sure there was a great mix minus for Zoom if we had a remote presenter. We originally had a Zoom primary and secondary. We just ended up going with one. I wanted to double check with my A2s that batteries were charging. I wanted to test all the backup 58s that they all had the right gain structure. That if someone picked it up talking on normal volume, they would sound great. Replace the batteries in the DJ's IEM uh, because we had these rechargeable batteries for all of our handhelds and lobs. But for the in-ear packs, we just had alkaline. So I wanted to make sure those were good. I had a backup track for this specific segment that we don't need to talk about. And I put all the Q numbers in Farago to see here's what's going on. So my audio playback app could look at the show flow and look at Farago, the playback software, and see those matching and know what to hit just in case I had to put out a fire and we still had to hit that Q. And then I had to load the Farago file on my old Mac. So I had this Mac right here that you can't see running the main thing and then a backup computer that was monitoring RF that could also unplug the cable, put it in and run Farago on it just in case my computer went down. All right, here are the, some specific show challenges and mixing strategies I used to overcome those. So the presenters wore masks, but when they were supposed to talk, they alone, even if they had multiple presenters, would take off their mask, talk, then put it back on. This led to a lot of, because they couldn't hear themselves, sometimes they, their hand would bump into their lobs, especially since the lobs were sub-miniature, you don't really notice them. And so I had one presenter in particular who hit it again and again and again. He was also not able to make it to rehearsal, so it's not like we could coach him beforehand. So it, I'm not trying to throw him under the bus, but that was something I had to deal with of like, hey, we can't interrupt him during his show that he's talking, but my A2s were able to talk to him before he went on again at the next set and coach him on it and say, hey, just be cognizant that that's there. He ended up fixing it. It was great. Uh, I, I, I found that the VI3000 onboard limiter was plenty fast enough to take care of all the peaks. I never had a single overload the entire show. Uh, I was a little nervous about that because not every limiter on every console is up to snuff can actually handle uh, getting someone clapping into a microphone on a really high peak hitting that limiter that hard and I found I was able to do that. They ended up clapping at one point and it took it like a champ. I was really impressed with that. The Countryman, uh, Countryman Lovs had a ton of 400 to 500 hertz. I think I already mentioned that. About a few people who were on t-shirts, their, their lobs were right here. At 1.1 instead of being off to the side so it wasn't resting on their throat, it got turned up and then rested on their throat and it got a little bit distorted. This is the same guy who, who took his mask off and hit his microphone. And that was just kind of happened one right after another. And that was near the top of the show. So that was kind of discouraging to have like those two audio things happen. And the grand scheme of things, they weren't that big of a deal. They're outside of our control. Uh, but just knowing later for other shows, what I've learned and so if we have sub-miniature lobs, if we're clip, clipping them on a t-shirt, don't have it to where the element's sticking up, have it to the side, especially if it's omni that's resting in front on their shirt. So there's a layer of protect, protection so it's not resting on their throat because that will immediately vibrate and resonate. It's like if you ever tried to, you finish a test in elementary school and put your head down in your desk and your friend would knock on it, it's super loud on your ear because solids transmit energy much stronger than air. And so when a mic comes and rests on something, that mic element gets shook. So it got distorted a little bit at that point. There were a lot of fast transitions and I, I feel like I, I've had a lot of corporate shows under my belt, but this is one of the shows I think I had to think the most intensely and juggle and spin the most amount of plates at the same time. So for example, the intro of the show had a DJ on a microphone who was writing his own music up and down. So I had to make sure those stay consistent. We pitched into an intro video. So I had to kill that microphone, kill the DJ music, video intro up, the show callers calling this. And then we're going to another playback machine that's a different input for, for audio playback for a dance segment. And then we're going directly out to our main executive on a loft. So that's four different source types. And that was fairly slow, but we had to move from that to another audio stinger, different fader, to three people on a panel on different lobs, and then move over to six different people with an audio stinger in between on a different set. So I just kind of how to step through that show. It was just a lot of cues, a lot of different types of inputs, and they all moved very quickly. So that really um, trying to solve problems of like, okay, do you have, is this person mic'd up? Do you hear them? Am I aware of the following cue? Is my audio playback op ready to go and hit this cue? This person got off the prompter, so now where are we? And so even though things are really well rehearsed and it's in order in a spreadsheet, just being aware of that like production stuff changes. And so uh, having to stay on top of that was definitely a challenge. It wasn't due to anyone's incompetency. It was just, this is just the way it goes. It's people with 
and we didn't have a ton of rehearsal time with everybody. This is the first time we saw it top to bottom. So it was just like a good reminder in the middle of the show. Like, okay, be flexible, roll with it. All right, that kind of transitions nicely into our last point, the, the, the key takeaways. Here were the five things that I really learned on the show. And is that as A1, you're mostly judged on hitting your cues. When someone's, a camera is on them, we expect to hear them. So, so you can spend all day dialing in the compression, getting the perfect tonality out of the mics, making sure the, the nap mics are mixed perfectly for ambience. But if someone gets up there and all you see is this and don't hear anything, then and that's a mess. Fortunately, in this show, that, that, that didn't happen. I'm grateful. It's happened to me before. It's a very humbling experience. But uh, that is of, again, just hit your cues. Number one, be on top of it. And if you need to make sure that the right people have the right information and you know what's going on, be assertive, get on calm, ask for what you need and make sure that happens. But there's also other things happening besides you. There's two other departments. There's the video director calling cameras. There's graphics getting ready for their lower thirds. So there's the show caller trying to make sure everyone's on the same page. So there's a lot of traffic and things going on. So you can't just jump in on calm and be like, hey, I don't, what's happening? You, you have to be cognizant of the entire show scope and know your piece within it. Stay up to date, follow the show flow, trust your show caller and hit your cues nice and tight. Number two is ask for help. I originally on the show did not have a dedicated audio playback, but there's happened to be another uh, production assistant on site who it was able to jump in and do a great job for me. And so if I would have tried to like be macho and stick to my guns, like I can do it. I, I don't think I would have been able to handle some of those transitions, how fast they were from a six person panel into the audio stinger, ducking their mics, we're jibbing over to another four person panel and then a DJ coming up under it. it I, I don't think I would be able to do that and it really be tight with all my cues without my brain turning inside out. So I was really grateful. And so ask for help when you need it. You may not always have the manpower or woman power to make it happen, but ask for help. Number three, keep calm clear. Again, with a 57 person crew, that's 57 different people trying to talk and coordinate depending on what position you are. So only talk when you need to. There was a point, there was just a lot of extra chatter and, and our um, producer got on and was like, hey, just chill out, ask for what you need for, when you need it, don't talk otherwise. So just a good reminder of calm etiquette and keeping calm clear. Number four, auto mixers are your friend. These were great having so many open microphones, especially lav microphones in an omni pattern. And the, the heater was on in the room the whole time. So there was more ambient noise than I would have liked. And so the auto mixer, uh, if you're unfamiliar, basically is smart in that it says, hey, I got eight lavs uh, or any input for that matter. And this one's coming in the strongest. So I'm going to prioritize it and duck down the others. And then when they're not talking, it's like, okay, let's listen some more. And now this one's talking, let's bring him up. And I bring her up. And it basically helps do some of the, the song and dance of having to bring other people down who aren't talking and make that easier. It has its limits, but it's a really, really helpful tool and ultimately makes for a cleaner sounding show. The VI3000 had two 16 channel units. I had 24 channels of RF, so I had to do a little bit of repatching of auto mixer inputs so the right people could be shared on the same auto mixer at the right time but it wasn't too big of a hassle i'm really glad they had that number of channels on it number five always be ready for remote presenters we tested someone on zoom uh, that was on the crew on the morning of just in case someone wasn't able to make it in and one thing i forgot to do was to make sure that their zoom mix minus that their output um had a limiter on it and it was gassed and nice and hot going back into Zoom because Zoom definitely manages the level of your audio inputs and wants it nice and hot. So I had to gas that. The, the person that they were testing it had to turn their computer all the way up the first time. And then later on, I, I gave them more gas. That was also able to throw the Zoom input in the auto mixer. So they got a clean mix minus back to them. Uh, before I had that on, it was a little bit uh, Zoom was fighting with itself a little bit because it's trying to do its own auto mixing between the person talking on Zoom and the remote feed it's getting in. So giving an auto mixed mix minus back to it is cleaner and helps it do the song and dance of picking which audio input is going back to the remote presenter a lot easier. Okay, that was that was a ton of information. I hope this was helpful for you, showing you what happened to me in this, this giant show, uh, uh, this corporate gig here in Arkansas. I was in a truck, a 57 person crew. It was crazy, it was so much fun. I am so grateful I had the opportunity to do it. I would love for you to let me know below, what was your biggest aha moment? Was uh, the number of cues we had to keep up with, how I was able to manage the team, the, the playback stuff, the RF management. I would love to hear from you. Any question you got, hit me up below. 
Please make sure and grab my Audio Mass Survival spreadsheet. It's at the link below or produced by mkc.com slash audio toolkit. I will catch you next time.